Well, good evening. Good to see you all here tonight. Uh, a couple things I want to remind you of. Uh, next week, next Wednesday, uh, there'll be nothing going on on campus, campus-wide. So there'll be no youth, no other Bible studies. There won't be any common ground, no Awana. So it's spring break week, and so uh, everybody uh, vacates to wherever, okay? So keep that in mind. Secondly, I was just talking with Sandra. Um, we're, she's in need of some help at the clothing ministry. So if you have the opportunity on Mondays or Wednesdays in the morning, as in, if you've worked in a retail store, you know, getting clothing out, folding it, and getting it put up right and all that, that's all it is. It's very light work, not a heavy work, right? No lifting or anything. So if you have a few hours, maybe a few hours, just a, a month, uh, she would greatly appreciate that there. So you might want to stop in and help her out on two Mondays or Wednesdays, uh, mornings from 9 to 11, 8 to 11. So three hours right there you go. All right. Any help would be much appreciated. Also, Easter Sunday, that's this coming Sunday, uh, we'll have two Sundays. We're expecting large crowds. And so if you um, normally attend the first service, we're asking you to maybe consider going to the second service to kind of level out the crowds. Um, 8, 8.30 is our normal heavy service, and so we're, we're planning for extra chairs and everything, but it would help just to be sure uh, to, if you normally go at 8.30, to say, hey, myself and my family, we're going to go to the 11 o'clock service so that we have plenty of room then at 8.30, all right? So we consider that. We're not forcing it. We're not calling out names or anything like that, but just asking if you would could consider that, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayers begin this uh, new study. God, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for um, your love of us, uh, your love of people, your creation. You loved them so much, loved us so much, that you provided a way that we might um, relate to you, and that way is Jesus Christ. And it's by uh, through him that we can come to you, and it's because of him that we're here this, this evening uh, to, to praise you and to thank you for the, the, um, the debt that was paid through Christ's shedding of his blood on the cross um, uh, that paid our sin debt. And we're also in the middle of Holy Week, and we're looking forward as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the grave didn't hold Christ. He arose from the dead and now uh, reigns with God the Father. And so we are um, praising you for that. And we know that because Jesus overcame the grave, because he now sits on his eternal throne, that we too um, will have eternity uh, with you um, because of what Christ did for us and us receiving the gift that he offered. So God, we're here this evening to praise you. Uh, we're looking at feasts, Lord, and so I pray over tonight and the coming weeks as we walk through the seven feasts that you would just uh, open our eyes to what you were doing with your people, Israel, uh, the Hebrew people, and then also then um, how that can relate to us um, as followers of Christ and how each feast really points to Christ and what Christ did for us. So God, thank you for this opportunity. We just lift it up to you, Lord, and we pray that you would um, uh, speak to our hearts as only you can do. And we lift it all up in the precious and powerful name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Well, it is good to see you tonight. And um, as we begin, we're going to sing all the songs tonight, all four songs that write in a row. So I'm just going to say a little something up front, and that is this. Um, a lot of the staff, a lot of our staff here have been doing what we do for a long time. I've been in music and worship ministry for 35 years, and I have seen a trend over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years in some circles and some churches that would say, you know, we need to tone down our talk about the blood because it's offensive. It's offensive to seekers. And I understand the mentality behind that, but friends, if, what it, what it, if it were not for the blood, where would we be? Where would we be? So tonight, we're going to sing some blood songs, which is very fitting as we think about and learn about Passover. You know these. Sing with me, please. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other 
but the blood of Jesus in our church, oh precious. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will you 
Hey, we're starting this new series, The Seven Feasts, and so it'll take how many weeks? Seven weeks, all right, there we go, plus the missing week next week, so it'll be a total eight weeks total, but anyway, tonight we're going to look at the Passover, and it's really fitting that we're starting this series with the first feast, Passover, uh, and it is, we're looking at Passover being celebrated even now to this day by uh, Jewish people and uh, Christians, Jew, um, Jewish and non-Jewish Christians um, uh, are looking at it as well um, and celebrating it in a slightly different way. Um, so anyway, it's, it's great. So let's look at uh, some things uh, concerning Passover and kind of walk through it. And, and I'm, you're going to see that in these coming seven weeks, um, the, the, uh, the feast look back at what God has done and celebrates that fact. There's some challenges with it, but it also, is, there is a prophetic word uh, within those feasts that God is using to bring the people along. Uh, and uh, some of those prophecies that we find are being and have been fulfilled, and others are yet to be fulfilled. Anyway, the first Passover. Most Christians are very familiar with the Exodus story of the Jews, uh, especially the events leading up to it. And we read uh, in Exodus of the ten plagues, uh, if you're like me, uh, you've read them so much, you tend to get, go through them, and yes, that's the plague of the frogs, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you quickly read them uh, because you've read them over and over and over again since you were young. Uh, and if you're like me, you might think that God was, uh, was, only, uh, was only hardening Pharaoh's heart uh, so that he would, he would force him to release the Jewish people as a side note, I talked to a lot of people, and I know Philip and I have kind of hashed this around some, about God hardening a person's heart um, to the point where they refuse uh, God, refuse to obey God. In this case, Scripture does tell us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. If you look at Exodus 9, we read there that, um, that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, somebody asked, well, if God hardens 
hardened Pharaoh's heart, does that mean that God wanted him to be punished in hell? That God would want him to go there? If so, then if Pharaoh, or anyone else for that matter, is, uh, is, uh, are they really responsible for their sin if God hardens their heart to not be receptive to, to, to God? Uh, when we look at the word hardened, uh, what's, uh, what comes to mind when you think of something being hard? It's, it's hard. It's impenetrable, right? Um, so when you look at the original language, the word hardened um, carries the understanding to make unchanging. <clears throat> when we see hardened, we think that God has made a heart, a, a shell around their heart so that nothing can penetrate it or put, uh, uh, nothing can, can get in. If God wills something, there is nothing that can change that from happening. So let me offer you a little different perspective maybe on that word hardened. Um, when, you, when we see the word hardened, think of maybe strengthened. We think of hardened being a hard shell, but hardened could mean your muscles are hard. It's strengthened. It is just as possible that God strengthened Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh would do what he willed to do from the beginning and was able to resist the will of God, that all would come to him in spite of what God was doing all around him. In any event, I saw in a commentary that God was doing more than just pressuring Pharaoh to release his people. God was teaching them that their false gods were nothing, and they were bringing judgment on them as a people uh, because of their idolatry. I read, here's part of that commentary. Uh, as an example, when God turned the Nile to blood, he was attacking their worship of of Kunum, the god of the river. Likewise, the plague of the frogs that followed was an attack on Hek. Hek, I, I think that's how you pronounce it. The frog-headed goddess of resurrection. She was the wife of Knum. Okay. The other plagues also were, were attacked uh, relating to other gods. Uh, lice stopped the Egyptians' sacrifices because of cleanliness issues. Swarms of flies were signed against Beelzebub, prince of the air, because flies were always flying around his ears. Livestock suffered disease for punishment against Apis, the sacred bull, while boils were opposed to Imhoptep, the god of med uh, medical cures. Hailstones showed the weakness of Nut, the sky goddess. Locust opposed Nepri, the grain god. Darkness was an attack against Re, the sun god. The death of the firstborn attacked all of the gods. So God was doing more than what we think when he brought about the ten plagues. In preparation for the exodus, God's final act was to kill every firstborn, every animal, every human being. But he provided a way of escape. And you know, um, they were um, to kill a... Um, uh, an unblemished lamb, and then put the blood on the doorposts and on the lentil. And those who had done that would be passed over. They were to eat the roasted lamb that night with unleavened bread, bitter herbs, with their loins girded. That means they were tucked in their sash or their belt. They were to have their sandals on their feet, their staff in their hand, Meaning what? Yeah. We're getting out of here. We're going to blow this pop stand real quick. All right? They were to eat in haste because it was the Lord's Passover and they would be leaving Egypt in the morning. It's interesting to note that if families purchased the lamb four days before Passover, which they would do if they were following the correct protocol for, for Passover with the instructions, then they would be purchasing their unblemished lamb on the same day that God was revealing his lamb, Jesus, triumphantly on a colt entering Jerusalem. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy as we read about in, in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, 
the foal of a donkey. There are other possible pictures that God provided us. We don't read this in Scripture, and I don't want to add anything to Scripture, but there are pictures pointed to Jesus as men have studied the traditions of, of Passover. Here are some from the commentaries that I read. There's historical evidence that the lamb was roasted upright on a pomegranate uh, pole with a crossbow through its shoulders. Hmm. Bring to mind a cross, right? The pomegranate pole was used because as a dry wood, it would not boil. Boiling was prohibited in preparing the lamb. It was also mentioned in, uh, from another observation of tradition that the pomegranate is a symbolic of royalty and priesthood. Notable point is that the entrails were tied around the head of the lamb as it was roasting so that it could be roasted evenly as with, with the body. And that tying, that wrapping around re re resembled what? Crown of horns, okay? Thorns, crown of horns, a crown of thorns. All right, let's look at the lamb for a minute. We've talked already about the lamb to some degree, but it was, it was selected from the her, uh, herd and chosen because why? It was unblemished. It was as perfect as it could be. I want to read from Luke chapter 2. In the same region, shepherds were staying at night in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Now, as I was preparing for tonight, I found an interesting point that I've never noticed before, and the question was asked in one of the commentaries. Did you ever wonder why this was a sign? This is a sign for you, a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Why is that a sign? How is that a sign? So I had to ask myself, I really didn't know. But then I looked, as, as, as I followed the commentary, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Bethlehem Ephraim. Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come to you to be a ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Now we've all heard that prophecy, but do you ever notice Micah 4.8? And you watchtower of the flock, fortified hill, daughter Zion. The former rule will come to you. Sovereignty will come to daughter Jerusalem. There's been, you know, they're, they're digging all around uh, the Middle or the, the Holy Land. Okay, they're always digging tells, and that was tells are places where there was uh, people, and they just kind of the way that you don't just move locations. You when things you you tear it down, you 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 build on top of it, and it gets larger and larger and larger. Okay, anyway, as they are discovering different things, they found something around Bethlehem that was a two-story tower. Kind of odd. Uh, when we read the announcement of Christ's birth, we, we assume that it was made to lowly shepherds, and, and you know that's the thought. However, priests also served as shepherds, and they were in these towers, this tower. Um, they were there from the temple uh, in that day. They tended sheep because as the sheep birthed lambs, they were there to make sure that the lambs remained unblemished so that they can then be used for sacrifice. So uh, they were there to help birthing of the sacrificial lambs. This would take place on the first floor of the tower. As soon as the lamb would born, was born, it would be wrapped in straps of cloth from old priestly undergarments to help the lamb remain unblemished. The priest would then place the lamb in a manger, to make sure that it wasn't trampled by the other sheep that were birthing lambs. Now it's quite possible that these shepherds who received the message from the angel about the birth of Christ, they were the ones that were in these towers. And when they went to the place where Jesus was laid, 
they would see the wrappings. They would see that he was lying in a manger. That would make sense to them. That would be the sign. This is the Lamb of God. Because we've been doing this for years in preparing the unblemished lambs for sacrifice. They saw the Lamb of God prepared for sacrifice, unblemished. Now, each Jewish family would purchase their lamb a few days before, four days before Passover. They would bring the lamb home, they would care for it, and preparing it for sacrifice. Now, if you've been a part of a family that brings home an, a, an animal, a baby animal, in this case, a, a lamb, how long do you think it would take for the children to become attached to this lamb? Wouldn't take long, would it? Not long at all. Then, the day that the father is to take the lamb to the temple to be, pet, to be sacrificed, I'm sure the question is, where are you taking it? Well, I'm going to take it to be set. When are you bringing it back? Well, I'm sorry, but it's not coming back. Why isn't it coming back? It is going to be sacrificed. So, there would be a lot of questions, and I'm sure there was a lot of tears, broken hearts that this lamb was going to slaughter. But it was a great lesson for the children. The lamb was shedding its blood for their sin. The serious nature of sin becomes very real to them. The family name uh, then was, was placed around the neck of the lamb. Now that might be symbolic in that the lamb is carrying the sins of the family as it goes to slaughter. But from a practical standpoint, the family wanted to make sure that the lamb that they took there was the lamb that he brought home to, to be roasted and eaten, right? Have you ever taken a cow or something to, to uh, the, 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 the processing plate? You want, even with deer, hunters, you want to make sure that the, the, the deer that I take there is the deer that I'm getting back, right? So anyways, that was, that was from a practical standpoint, that was what they were doing. The Passover meal. The meal varied, or it has varied only slightly. 3,500 years they've been doing this. The main meal can be different based on variations of taste due to generations or cultures. But the main picture, the order of the feast is the same. It hasn't changed virtually at all in 3,500 years. They follow a book called the Haggadah. That book outlines in great detail of what is to take place for the Passover meal. There are four cups of wine that are to be part, uh, taken during the, the service. They are four cups to remind everyone of the four promises found in Exodus chapter 6. Let's read those words. Therefore tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians. Now each cup had its own name and it had a specific time designated for it throughout the service. Um, and each of those four cups were significant as from the, were taken from the phrases that we read in that, that passage from Exodus. The first cup is the cup of blessing or sanctification. It comes from the phrase, I will bring you out. God promised to separate the Jews from Egypt. It also reminds us that sanctification is to be, is we're to be separated from sin. We'll look at the bread in a moment, but it also is a picture of something that has no sin. The second cup is called the cup of praise. They're to give praise for God for delivering them from the bondage of slavery. Then the main meal is eaten. The third cup that everyone drinks from is the cup of redemption, the third cup. This is the cup where we hear the words from Jesus found in Matthew chapter 26. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the cup in which we partake as Christians in the Lord's Supper. The fourth cup is at the end of the ceremony and commonly called the cup of the kingdom. 
Now, Jesus refrained from drinking this cup when we read the 29th verse. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the cup of kingdom is not, was not drank, drunk, drank, was not part. They didn't have a cup of that, that cup because um, Jesus wanted to fulfill all prophecies. He didn't want to drink from that cup since the kingdom was not yet established. One other point with this cup we'll look at in a moment. Actually, the third cup. Let's look at the bread of the Passover meal. It's called matzah, right? Matzah. You, you can go to the store and buy it if you want. It is a bread made without yeast because yeast represents what? Sin. Okay? And they went through great uh, detailed work. Uh, the mother and children of the household, they would clean all the yeast, all the leaven out of the house. In fact, they made kind of a game of where father would go around with a, with a little uh, feather broom and would try to find yeast and, and put it into a, um, a container. So when it was baked, it looked like a large saltine cracker. And if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It's baked in such a way that it, it has holes in it. Um, it's, uh, the result in, in the baking, it gives a, a striped appearance with brown spots resembling bruises. Now today, there are no temples. There is no sacrifice within the Jewish uh, people, within Hebrew people. So the rabbis have ruled that the matzah bread could sacrifice or substitute or suffice for the lamb. Interesting. We'll see about that. We'll see that in a moment. The matzah fits perfectly, though, with Isaiah 53. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. And we're going to see in a minute that, that part of this bread, this, this matzah, represents Jesus. So during the Seder, this service, matzah is placed into a pouch that has three compartments. So three pieces of matzah are placed in this pouch. Each pouch has three compartments. Jews recognize the compartments as representing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christians, however, see that it is God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the middle matzah in the service is removed. It is broken. And um, half of it, called the afikomen, is wrapped in a cloth and hid or, hidden for later to be found by the children. If there's children in the family, they would, they would have the children go search it out. It made it kind of a game. And the winner or the, person, the child that found the, the, uh, hidden, uh, the hidden afikomen uh, would be uh, given a monetary prize, uh, but, uh, four or five dollars or whatever it is, okay? The Greek meaning for afikomen is he who is coming. According to Jewish tradition, a, a place is set aside also for Elijah because it's believed that the Messiah will come at Passover to bring redemption. And the place is set for Elijah because he is the forerunner of Messiah. Malachi 4.5, look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Later in the service, the afikoma is found, as I just said, the kids would find it. It's pulled back from under the table or wherever it's hidden. It's, wrapped, it's pulled out of the wrapping, and it's broken and eaten by those in the service. It's at this point that Jesus said in the Last Supper, he broke the bread and said, take it and eat it. This is my body. Let's look at some prophecy that we see in this Passover feast. The feasts that were introduced by God had more than one purpose. And we're going to see that as a common theme throughout the feasts. They provide a way for Jews to look back in time, remember their history with God, and as looking back as, we, uh, as they celebrate Passover, they remember where they came from. They came out of slavery. Their people were in bondage. They cried out to God for decades. God sent them Moses to confront uh, Pharaoh. He heard their cry. 
and he called on Pharaoh to release them there because he had enslaved them. The Passover meal includes several foods, that, uh, the items that remind them of the plagues that were sent. The bitter herbs remind them of the bitterness of enslavement. In fact, the bitter herbs, uh, uh, we had a Seder here uh, several years ago, and oftentimes the bitter herbs are horseradish. And if you eat a little horseradish, if you breathe the wrong way, it'll bring tears to your eyes, I'm telling you. And so there's this idea of weeping because of the enslavement, okay? There was um, uh, food to remind them of, of bricks they had to make from mud. All the various foods reminded them of what they endured up to that point. A, a, a shank a, a bone from the lamb was there to help them remember the sacrifice of the, uh, of the unblemished lamb. Uh, unblemished lamb. Uh, that which its blood was painted on the doorpost and on the lintel. The Passover meal reminded them of redemption that God provided to them in freeing them from slavery. Uh, we see it as what Christ did in freeing us from the slavery of sin. There was a prophetic aspect of the service too. Each Jewish family chose their lamb on the 10th day of Nisan, as we said. It so happened that the 10th day was the same day that Jesus uh, entered Jerusalem triumphantly as we talked about shouting Hosanna. And we read about that again in Zechariah 9.9. We've already read it, so we won't read it again. But it should also be noted that on the 14th day of Nisan, the same hour the lamb was being sacrificed at the temple, Jesus, the lamb of God, was also being crucified on the cross. The Passover meal is a reminder of God's redemptive plan, and it was pointing towards the Messiah all along since its inception, and Jesus came to fulfill those prophetic words. Not only did the Passover meal look back at God's redemption from Egypt, but it also looked forward, as I said, to the Messiah. Let's go back to the third cup. That third cup had similarities to um, Jewish wedding traditions, uh, wedding traditions covenants. When a Jewish young man would come to the house, he and his father would go to the house of the, of the girl that he was interested in marrying, and they would meet, uh, they would talk, he would present a, a glass of wine to her. Um, at the same time, his father would present the family of the bride, the bee, if she, re if she would agree, um, they would provide, uh, 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 they would lay out the dowry price to the bride's father. In that day, boys that were born to Jewish families were a good thing, right? The boys would grow into young men. They could help earn money. They could carry on the father's line of work, the father's trade, if you will. Uh, they lived in a family home, so they all lived together. So they would provide income. It would take care of the parents as they got older and could not work as much. That wasn't the case with the father of a young girl. Uh, she would not be able to work as, the bo as a boy could work. Um, she could not carry on the father's line of work, trade, or, or venture out because uh, she is a, is a young girl, as a girl that just was not done. The family of a girl didn't have that ability. They wouldn't have that income stream, if you will, uh, down the road. So, also, at some point in time, a young boy would come knocking at the door and would take her and take her to be with his family. So this bride, this dowry, provided for the family of the young girl for the future. She was bought with a price, so to speak. As to the wine, if she drank it, she was accepting the bet betrothal. He would then inform her that he was leaving to begin preparing a place for her at his father's house. That's where he went immediately, because she's now said that I will marry you. So he immediately goes and starts preparing a place. As you know, the, they, would have, they all lived as a family under one compound. So he's going to start preparing a place. Now, she would probably ask, when are you coming back? And he would say, I don't know. My father knows. Seems I've heard words like that. Have you heard words? Like, I've read that somewhere. Jesus had the very same discussion with the disciples that very night. This is just one of the ways that Jesus gives us a picture of our relationship to him 
through the Jewish wedding, the bride, his church, and he, the groom. After they drank from the third cup, symbolically the cup of betrothal, Jesus told them, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am, not, that I am going to prepare a place for you. I'm sorry, would I have to, I told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, then I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Jesus was talking to his future bride, the church. Now, if it were up to the groom, he would go back to his father's house. He would put up some sticks and cover it up with a tarp or something, you know, and hightail it back to get his bride, right? But his father was there to make sure, no, 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 no. You need to prepare a room that is right for the bride that you are bringing back to my house. So he made sure that the groom did everything, his son did everything perfectly for the bride before allowing his son to go get her. And at just the right time, the father would say, go get her. The bride and groom would then celebrate their togetherness at the father's house for seven days, secluded in that room. After that, they would come out to the chamber, from the chamber, observe a wedding feast that was prepared in their honor. The bride and groom would start the feast with a cup of wine that they would drink together called the cup of consummation. This cup is the same cup, the fourth, I'm sorry, the third cup of Passover. I'm sorry, the fourth cup, the cup of Passover, the cup of the kingdom. So, when we take the cup of redemption at our communion, we're actually accepting our betrothal to the Lord. We, the bride, were bought with a price, the blood of Christ. We are betrothed to Christ, and he, was, he is now preparing a place for us. He was to prepare for the wedding and the feast that follows. He's coming back, but only when... The Father says, go. Eventually, one day, we will drink the cup of consummation with our Lord at the marriage feast of the Lamb in our eternal kingdom. So the Afikoman represents the body of Christ. The Afikoman is broken in two, representing death. It's buried for a while, and then it is brought back for a price. We paid the kid because he found it. It's without yeast. It's without sin. It is pierced and it is bruised. The afikoman that is used every year, every year until Jesus arrived, announced that this Messiah would be broken. He would be pierced for us. Then Jesus pointed to the real meaning. In Luke 22, he broke the bread, gave thanks, gave it to him and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He was without sin. He was going to be pierced. He would be bruised. By his wounds, we would be healed. He would be buried and then raised to life. To the Jews, they're still looking for the Messiah. To Christians, he came. He's here. It's Christ. So how can we apply some things here. The blood is on the doorpost of our, house, of our hearts. As followers of Christ, he has made us white. Our sins are now gone. His blood is on, our door, on the doorpost of our soul. Because of that, we're free from God's wrath over sin. We enjoy a righteous standing before God because of what Christ did for us. As we look forward to this coming Resurrection Sunday that's just a few days away, let's remember what it cost God. Just as important, let's remember that he overcame the grave. He lives today, amen? <laughs> because we have the blood on our doorpost, we too will overcome the grave and live with him forever. Secondly, I hope we remember the events that took place some 2,000 years ago as we celebrate this Holy Week. But I hope that we do it 
and that we celebrate Easter each and every day. We have redemption through the blood of Christ. Celebrate it. Celebrate it each and every day. But also remember to live it. Don't live in fear and doubt. We sang about that earlier. Live in boldness and confidence. Face every trial, every battle with the expectation that in Christ we have the victory. He's already paid the price. He's won the battle. We should also remember what it cost Christ. We should strive to live, with, live for him. How do we show our love? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? You'll do what I tell you. You'll do what I say. Live out what we read in Scripture so that the world will know who Christ is. That because he died and rose again, we too might have life eternal. And then thirdly, there is the fulfilled prophecy. During Holy Week, Jesus fulfilled a good number of prophecies. We found, we've been able to look at a few in, pa in the Passover. God meant Passover to be more than what the Hebrew people celebrate. It's meant more than just celebrating past victories. God meant Passover to be more, he, he meant it, he, he's pointing them, he's pointing us to what he plans to do in the future. Part of the Passover has been fulfilled in Christ. Part of it is yet to be. We have a God that has never missed, never um, not fulfilled that which he's promised. He's batting a thousand. And we can stand with insurance that, assurance that he will do what he says he's going to do. Not only because he's God, but we can look at his history. He has never, ever gone back on a promise or a, prophet, word, a prophetic word. So as we walk through these feasts, as we look at Passover, we will see concurrent meanings, including prophecy. And the fact that he has done everything that he said he's going to do should give us confidence in moving forward that he will accomplish that which he promises, that which he says. He will bring everything to its full completion as he has told us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. I thank you as we walk through these seven feasts that we will uh, just see uh, uh, a different aspect of who you are in your plan, as you revealed it to the Hebrew people, um, and as they celebrate feasts, in many cases, in many ways, they don't fully understand, fully see um, what your intense attention was in, in giving us these feasts. Help us to see them, Lord, as we walk through them, as we can look back and see uh, what your intention was. And, and Lord, I pray that, um, that we would walk boldly, confidently, knowing that uh, you will accomplish that which you've uh, said that you will do. May we, um, during this week, be focused on Christ. And Father, may it go beyond Resurrection Sunday. I pray, Lord, that we would live our lives in such a way that, that people would see Christ in us, that we would um, be your ambassadors. We would be shining examples of what a changed life through Christ can be, can do. May we go from this place and may we live our lives with confidence and boldness. The world is getting darker, but the light of Christ continues to shine. And may we point people to that light, that they too might experience life eternal only found in that light, Jesus. And I ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.